Hey, this is Matt Ertz, the Madison County Historian. We are still working to document the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And we are very lucky today to be talking to two people, uh, Perry Cordo, the Executive Director, and Christine Evans, the Associate Se Executive Director of the Madison Cortland ARC. Thank you for, both for being here today. Thank you, Matt. And for those that aren't familiar, can you explain what the ARC is and what it does? Well, what ARC, we, uh, we support about 1,500 individuals with developmental and intellectual disability in Madison and Cortland County. We provide residences in Madison and Cortland County. We have eight in each county that supports about 100 individuals. We have day programs in four different locations, uh, three in Madison County, one in Cortland County. We have uh, clinics throughout, I think it's four counties, Chris? Yeah. And 17 locations, I believe. Um, we have an integrated business right here in Oneida that provides work for people with and without disabilities. It helps us support the agency and uh, many other programs that we support. So, um, And this, this is part of a broader organization too. There's the Arc of New York and I, the Arc of the U.S., which I was unaware of until I started working on this. You guys all kind of have the same mission to some degree, helping folks with disabilities. Yes, right now there are uh, 40 uh, ARCs in New York State uh, that cover, I believe it's 63 or 62 counties throughout the state. And uh, the ARC of the U.S., there are ARCs throughout the entire country, but I, I believe New York is uh, far larger than any other state as far as people that we support with dis disabilities. Okay, so talk a little bit about um, we we kind of use a few dates. March 11th was the day I think it got real for a lot of people. That's mm -hmm. when um, Tom Hanks was diagnosed and the NBA shuts down. And then March 13th, we start to see schools close. March uh, 16th was the, the halftime order. And then March 20th, we had the what they call the pause. So talk about when did it first appear on your radar and what was your initial responses? Well, I'll talk a little bit about the the pause, and then I'll let Chris uh, talk about one of the stories that, that I like to talk about that really affected us is really in our residences. Uh, we pretty much shut down the residences, like you said, around the middle of March, and it's pretty much been a shutdown, pretty much stay in place for four months. So really, no one has been in and out of our residences except the individuals that work there and the individuals that live there. So that's been an extreme burden on, on the people that we support. So really, they've had no visitors, no friends, no family for four months. And that just opened up uh, back a few weeks ago. I believe we opened back up on Saturday, June Probably 19th. Yeah. 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 Just back up for visitors. And it's just for uh, short, short visits, uh, two-hour visits. They have to be planned. So that's been a real effect. So the pause has not only affected our employees, it was really affected people in our residences. So that's that's been uh, a real tough uh tough situation for the people that we support. And it's also affected our day programs. And I'll let Chris talk about that. It's, uh, you know, we shut down the day programs at pretty much the same time as we did had the shutdown for the residences. Yeah. Just a I mean, quick question before Chris, and I apologize. Sure. How do you support, so one of the things we've talked to a lot of different organizations and people, how do you support folks that are in these homes mentally? Because obviously they may not always understand why they're not getting the normal visitors they do, or, you know, are, are you cap are they are you able to support them in the sense of giving them computers and Skype and, and, and modes like this where they can at least have yeah. some interaction beyond a phone? Yes, yes, um, we've uh, we provided that uh, Skype, like you said, Zoom, uh, whatever modality uh, through a cell phone to talk to their friends, talk to their family. Also, we have supports through our clinic, uh, through telehealth, which has been uh, excellent throughout this uh, unfortunate ordeal. So that's also helped support. And actually the direct support professionals that work every day in our houses have been a huge support to the people in the homes, just providing support for them every single day. And that's, that's really been, uh, that's our frontline workers and they've done it just a tremendous job. Okay. I, I apologize for interrupting you, Chris. You were going to talk about, um, the, I already kind of went on. Go ahead. So our day programs, you talked about the pause, you know, and you mentioned a, a date of, of March 16th in which we had to close our day programs down. So that affected not only the individuals who reside in our IRAs who went to programs, but also people who 
live in other IRAs from other, you know, whether it's state run facilities or other private organizations, but also more importantly, people who live at home, you know, so people who live, still live with their families um, are now home with their families because program essentially has been shut down. Um, Can you kind of real quick explain what a day program is, you know, so for those that aren't familiar, this is an opportunity for them to go out and, and work or, or do different things to build their, their, their life. Yes. So we have um, what we call day, have day habilitation, um, both for a senior program. So for older adults who will come in, do activities, um, do have opportunities within the community, um, and just kind of a socialization um, type of group. And, and same with our other day have locations um, in Oneida and Cortland. Um, it provides them you know, the opportunity to socialize with other individuals. And again, like I said, to be able to get out into the community um, and have those resources and, and staff, you know, provide them with those resources. Um, so that those were essentially all shut down on the 16th and we're still shut down. Um, however, um, our staff, our day have staff, um, have started working and backfilling and providing some services within our residential program. Um, so they're, they're still trying to provide those services where they can. We're trying to provide those services to some families in their home where we can. And, and as Perry mentioned earlier, virtually, you know, over the internet and, and through Skype or through a Facebook messenger type application or Google application to be able to provide those services um, to individuals that, that we can provide them to. So talk about one of the other things that's come up talking to folks is, how do you support your in-house staff? Because there's a stress level on them now, not only from what they normally do, but there's this fear you don't wanna be bringing it into the place, so there's more steps involved with that. Then there's the stress of, I'm guessing they're wearing more equipment right now, um, which a lot of them talk about that takes away from some of the communication you have because there's just so much on top of you. So talk a little bit about your support of the staff that's working with these folks. Well, like you said, communication, that's really, really the key. And we've uh, provided uh, PPE when needed. Um, staff have to wear masks throughout their shift uh, every single day and uh, just providing support and guidance that we get from the local health department and from the state as to, uh, <clears throat> what we have to provide and what they need. And, and the support from their managers has also been key. So we've just provided, just communicate as best we can, uh, provide PPE as needed, and just uh, support them as they need it. When, when um, you have the folks that are in the homes, talk about the communication with families, because there had to be a certain level of frustration at the situation, not at individual people or anything like that, but they want to see their loved ones just as much too. And how does that communication work? And how do you kind of make sure they're getting as much information as you can legally give them um, and, and, and make sure everyone's in the loop together? Yeah, we, yeah we've tried to provide communication through social media, through email, uh, telephone conversations. And usually it's, it's the, the person that the family member usually communicates with the most. That's really their, their, they're comfortable talking to that person and that's the key communicator with the family. So we pr provide as much as we can and just tell them what the situation is. And a lot of times we don't know what the answer is, but just providing that communication constantly has really been the key. Uh, how will this impact you guys moving forward? Because it doesn't appear like it's going to go away anytime soon, but on top of that, is it going to change some of your protocols that you do? Because now that you've kind of gone do this, it makes more sense. Yes. And I like, I'll let Chris talk about that too, especially with the day programs. You know, like Chris said, we're still, we're still on hold. We're still on a pause. We don't know when that'll continue. And, and obviously it's not going to be the way it was um, until there's a vaccine or even after this vaccine, we're probably going to relook at some of the things that we do smaller groups in larger areas. Um, maybe we'll have individuals in one house that live together. They all come to the day have program together. It's just uh, different scenarios. We're putting together plans now so that when we're able to reopen, we're ready, but it is going to be different. Uh, and we really don't know what it's gonna be like until it happens. But uh, yeah, obviously it will be different. And, 
it's it's going to be a, a new a new world for us, and we're just going to have to adapt. We're adapting every day to all the changes that are that are happening. Well, and we're inundated with information, some of which is current, some of which is not current, and some of which is not accurate, um, unfortunately. So that's the other thing is you guys are, I'm assuming, disseminating through stuff constantly. Um, and that, that always is a struggle. When we've talked to the public health department, to our county administrators upstairs, they've all referenced that sometimes you find out as the governor is talking what they're saying. You know, what you're, you're finding out in the moment what they're telling everyone. So um, Chris, go ahead with, with, with the thoughts on the changes to the day uh, events. Well, I think we're just in the, the planning of process now and, and to your point, not really knowing, you know, what new protocol, what new procedure, what new regulation is going to be delivered. So we're doing our best to put those things in place as far as the size of the groups that we will have going forward, um, cleaning schedules that we have going forward staffing schedules that we have going forward and keeping the same staff kind of like what we're doing now in residential we're trying to keep the same staff with the same groups so that you reduce the risk of intermingling or and transferring um, transportation is going to be a big issue mm -hmm. of consideration you know where we have big buses and vans that that bring people into um, our day programs you know we'll need to reconsider how that happens um, and, and how do we reduce the number of people on the bus and still get the people who need to be there, um, there effectively and efficiently as possible. Um, just everyday things like eating and, and people now bringing in their own food versus utilizing some of the Meals on Wheels and some of the other resources that we have for senior program in the future um, we'll likely need to do um getting on and off the off the bus in and out of um program doors um storing stuff using common items like crayons or markers and you know craft things all those things need to be considered and and we're in that process of figuring out how best to do that now so basically it would have been easier to say what you didn't have to do than it would have been <laughs> to say what you did yeah um is there Anything else you'd like to say to the, the folks in the homes, to the families, to anyone that has, has utilized ARC over the course of time? Well, what I'd like to say is, is safety is the most important thing. That's really our utmost concern uh, is the safety of the individuals we support and of our employees. And we've been lucky um, as of right now, everyone is healthy. All of the people that we support and all of our employees are healthy and we wanna continue it that way. And like you talked about with cleaning, uh, a lot of our administration buildings are open right now. Uh, we have reduced staff and we have cleaning protocols that we go through now and we'll continue that when we open up our day head buildings. We're doing that through our houses. So that's the most important thing is keeping everyone safe. That's the most important thing and communicating with the families, just uh, letting them know what we're doing and keeping the communication lines open with their loved ones. That's the most important thing that we're, we're doing right now. Anything to add, Chris? I think we've prided ourselves, you know, over the years of, of being innovative and, and providing the best services possible um, to the people we support. And I think going through this, I think has demonstrated that we continue to do that. We're continuing, continuing to provide services in an even more creative way, you know, through telehealth and through, you know, virtual um communications and and you know so i think we continue to do those things and we'll continue to support the individuals um as best we can and and where we can and come up with new and creative ways to still provide those services one final kind of question that just came to me do you have an idea so the state has hit phase four i don't think we know if there's a phase five um do you have you guys had any idea of when you might be able to start the day stuff again no, no, unfortunately, no. And oh. um, what we do know is that when we do start, uh, we'll start it slow and making sure that, you know, we're doing it the right way and we're doing it safely. So that's like, like Chris talked about, we already have a plan in place. And when we get the go ahead to start back up, we'll make sure that that plan is correct and that we can do it safely and slowly. And uh, that, that's what will happen. And we're not sure when it'll be. It could be in a week, two weeks, two months. We're not sure. But uh, when we do it, we'll do it the right way. Yeah, I think the 
Post Standard maybe in the last couple of weeks actually had an article about um, the homes and the struggle with people inside them, not always understanding why people weren't visiting. Um, and I think it was from the outside family's perspective that was really interesting. But um, thank you for all that you do. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I know everyone right now is, is so busy. Um, we wish you nothing but the best. And hopefully I don't have to talk to you in this kind of setting again, but maybe we'll give you a call when things open up a little more to see how things are doing. That'd be great. Thank you, Matt. All right. Thank you both. Bye-bye.